So I slightly regretted the title because I included landscape and resource use, which is ridiculous because it's far too big. It's an enormous uh, topic. But I'm going to do a little bit on landscape and then I'm going to move on to resources. So um, I work in the very far distant past. Ah, wrong way. Nope. So we'll start again. So presentation Start again. I'll just uh, maybe do it like this. Yeah. So uh, the very far distant past is obviously popul populated by um, a wide range of different hominin groups. Uh, hominin means that it's basically from the genus Homo. Um, I'm not going to go into this. It's extremely complicated. Uh, I'm sure you'll have read things in the news lately. It's become very topical with all the genetics. Uh, uh, the, they keep discovering new new species. There's a Denisovans, the Neanderthals. There's a new species that uh, doesn't actually exist, but it's been identified genetically and so on. So I'm not going to do any more than say sort of that, okay? Um, we work from about one million years uh, onwards, so kind of uh, in the, at the beginning of the branching onwards, and I only work in Europe. And so um, it's an enormous, absolutely enormous time period, uh, obviously uh, populated by a range of different hominin species. So this is, uh, uh, again, I don't really know, you know, um, what level to put this introductory bit because I have no idea how much you know and how much you don't know about the past. But anyway, um, you probably know this. This is the, uh, this is the, uh, one, the, for the last one million years, this is the climate history of, um, of the world, obviously the, the, the second half of the quaternary period. And um, this is the time period of uh, the human op occupation of Europe, which uh, began around 1.2 million years ago. So obviously, very strong uh, climate change all the time, C climatic uh, variation between very cold periods and very hot periods, which obviously had uh, strong implications in terms of um, the type of uh, lifestyles and how people lived and so on. So the, 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 our, our um, pre-agricultural -agric past is divided. It's called the Paleolithic, which I'm sure you already know. It's divided into the Lower Paleolithic, which is the longest period, which starts around 3 million years ago and finishes around 300,000 years ago and is peopled by um, Homo erectus and a variety of other hominin species. Then we have the one that's probably you'll have probably heard of, um, better, which are the Andernils, the, the Denisovans, and so on, and this new unidentified uh, species. And this is the Middle Paleolithic, and this stretches from around 300,000 years ago up to around um, 45, 50,000 years ago. Okay, uh, and these are all, um, yep. Uh, the, the Middle Paleolithic is really the great time period of the Neanderthals. Okay, so it's a time period that's quite intensively studied because everyone's very keen on the Neanderthals and knowing more about them. It's very interesting. And then finally, we've got the Upper Paleolithic, and this is divided into the Early Upper Paleolithic, which is the time when you have uh, the Neanderthals and early Homo sapiens coexisting in Europe together. And it's also the time when the Neanderthals eventually disappear. So again, it's a time period that people uh, work on a lot because everyone's very keen and very interested in trying to understand how the Neanderthals disappeared and how the modern, modern human populations were able to come in and kind of take over. And uh, so this is, and then the late Upper Paleolithic from around 20,000 years ago, which is just Homo sapiens, or 25,000 years ago, which is just Homo sapiens. So uh, this is, I'm going to do a very little bit of uh, landscapey stuff. Obviously, this is Europe around uh, 18,000 years ago. And um, obviously, the climate uh, and uh, the availability of land is very important when we're looking at trying to reconstruct um, where people lived and how they lived. And so obviously, this is, uh, most of Europe was uh, periglacial at this time. And uh, however, even so, there were still uh, populations of uh, people living very relatively relatively near even the glaciers. So this is, uh, I don't know if you can guess where this is, um, <laughs> quite difficult to see. This is actually Northwest Europe and Great Britain, okay, uh, 16, 17,000 years ago. Um, and so the ice retreated very quickly and was obviously the sea level was much, much lower than it is today. So where you see this, uh, this here, this is Northwest Scotland. <laughs> 
okay this is Doggerland here which is uh, now underwater and this is kind of UK there um, and uh, there were populations of reindeer hunters who lived just below the ice during the height of the of the last ice age extraordinary um, adaptability and um, the earliest of these were called the Hamburgian culture they lived in northern Germany and uh, Denmark and then as the ice retreated they came northwards kind of following following um, uh, reindeer herds and um, moved up into uh, Britain, North Britain, um, and even up into northwest Scotland. And this site that uh, Maurizio just mentioned, we've just found this, and at the moment it's uh, very exciting. I need to get it radiocarbon dated, but it's uh, probably one of the most northerly post-glacial, or this is a late glacial interstadial, this is late glacial interstadial, because then we have the Loch Lomondry advance or afterwards, but this is uh, one of the earliest, let's say, post-Aventian or ice, ice melting sites uh, in Northern Europe. So now I'm going to be flitting about a lot because you have to flit about a lot uh, when you talk about the Paleolithic, okay? So we're suddenly jumping here into the Middle Paleolithic and West Asia. This is Israel and Jordan. And this is just to give you an idea again of uh, site distribution. So when we look at site distribution and when we look at where people lived, they often lived on the edges of environmental zones um, because this gave them access, obviously, to greater numbers of resources and so on. So we get a lot of sites on coastlines, although we have to remember that actually the coastlines today are probably not what the coastlines were in the past and um, but even so relatively near uh, coastlines and also we get sites very commonly um, on the edge of upland zones so inland on the edge of um, coastal plains and near uplands and so so forth and this obviously gives uh, gives gave the gave the people access to a greater range of different resources uh, and again up rivers that's, uh, this is Middle Paleolithic uh, England, and this is site distribution in Middle Paleolithic England, and of course we find uh, sites, um, again, um, the, the, you, there's not a shortage of water in England, as I'm sure everyone knows, but um, it, there's accessibility. When you have um, landscapes, particularly when you're in interglacial periods and it's very forested, the um, waterways provide access up into, uh, they provide openness and access we don't know if they had boats, they probably did. Um, there is evidence from other places that they might have had water transport, but even so, just the actual openness of being in a waterway made it easier for access. And the other thing that is really important when we're looking for sites are, is the raw materials. Now obviously plants were um, extremely uh, well used and um, probably provided the majority of raw materials but the one that survives is stone. And um, when we're looking at archaeological sites from the um, Paleolithic period, the mo what you get most of all is uh, stone. So this is, a, this is a, a, an example of a Salutrian um, point, a very beautifully, beautifully made um, uh, artifact but um, and across Europe the main raw material is flint. flint. In northern in Scotland we have different raw materials because it's um, volcanic but across much of the European continent they have different types of flint and so if you map out the flint sources you can usually correlate the sites that you find to the flint sources and either the quite, quite often find sites close to this or you can map out the way people moved around the landscape and so on based on the sources of the of the actual flint. Now I'm going to... Can you tell me what the Spanish word is for flint? Do you know? Oh God, silex. Silex, yeah. Yeah, okay, any... Is everything okay with the English? Because I can't speak Spanish, yeah? Yeah, okay, so now I'm going to jump to something completely different because this is really important. We're going much more recent again here. We're going to the very end of the hunter-gatherer period, the early to mid-Holocene. However, the use, the, the, um, the use of coastal resources um, in the early to mid-Holocene was so enormous that it altered the landscapes of most of the coastlines around the world. Um, you find these shell mounds, and this is an example I took off the web, simply on purpose I took it off the web because <coughs> it's not one of mine, because you get this everywhere. Um, and they're absolutely vast, these things, and they have changed, um, I think India is about the only place, because probably because of the lack of, of resor available resources, um, for these huge landscape changing um, uh, features that um, occur all around the landscape, uh, coastal landscapes all over the world. And so um, 
I did an ethnoarchaeological project, I have been doing an ethnoarchaeological project in Senegal in a mangrove swamp uh, called the Saloum Delta, just about 100 kilometers south of Dakar, and so this is an ethnoarchaeology project that I did to try to understand, because people find these huge shell mounds everywhere. Um, you know, there are some enormous ones in Northern Australia, Southern Africa, Brazil. Quite often the very big ones are, cons are, are found in places where there's a very, very great um, biodiversity underwater. So uh, often the, where there's some very, uh, the arrival of different currents and so on. So you can normally, the huge ones can normally be mapped to underwater biodiversity. Um, but nobody really understands uh, why they built these huge mounds, how they built them, how many people it involved and so on. So I was given the opportunity to work in the Saloum Delta with a, a colleague of mine, Abdullah Kamara, who is from Senegal. And so we set up an ethno-archaeological project trying to understand uh, how these landscapes were changed and how we were able to use this to interpret archaeology. And so this is where I worked and um, this picture on the right is um, a place called Jifar and we'd been working on here for quite a number of years and then one day we came and suddenly we saw this enormous mound of shells and this had grown up based on um, murex exploitation um, just off the coast uh, the uh, there was uh, quite a lot of Japanese and Korean companies wanting suddenly wanting murex shellfish and so everyone went off and started doing uh, murex fishing and within um, two years or a year and a half they'd built this incredible uh, enormous shell mound that if it was left obviously would landscape become become a part of the landscape and so what I did was I started realizing that you could actually trace the whole evolution of these uh, of change of this landscape um, in the Saloum Delta and how it happened and so the mangrove swamps are very damp places so with the accumulation if people kept going back to the same place every time they started accumulating shells and so this created a dry environment and so people uh, so the islands were gradually created because it has a lot of artificial islands this place all created around shells and so bit by bit uh, small dry areas were created and then um, this insulated um, this insulated the land um, from the, the, the damp ground and so people started putting their houses on uh, these uh, middens. Uh, this led the mid the, the, these middens, these dry places, to becoming temporary villages and so then be they became named places. So they were named places in the landscape. So you're seeing a real evolution of landscape change here, sort of in, in, in speeded up version. Then on, in the villages people died and so when people died they were buried and so they became uh, burial grounds and cemeteries so then they became ancestral burial places um, because your ancestors were buried here and then um, the calcium carbonate attracts the baobab trees and so the baobab trees come onto the shell middens and then um, the baobab trees, uh, some of the baobab trees are inhabited by pangols which are the natural spirits, the, 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 the indigenous uh, religious spirits of the area and once a pangol inhabits a baobab tree then it becomes a sacred place so they became sacred places. And then they develop their own ecosystems and so they become uh, resource sources of resources for animals and for plants and stuff and so they become, uh, they create their complete own ecosystem and actually you can see them even looking on Google Earth. We don't even need to go out into the field anymore, we can just actually see them because they've changed the landscape so much and they're like circular entities within the mangrove swamps um, that are visible from the boat uh, because of the baobab trees and visible on Google Earth because of the ch difference in vegetation. And eventually they completely alter the landscape and become places in their own right and this is one called Jurumbu Bak which is uh, huge, absolutely enormous, but has completely created its own kind of ecosystem within this mangrove swamp. And this is just an example of one of the biggest places in the world, uh, Florida Keys in USA, um, that was absolutely enormous, covered 125 acres. And uh, so uh, this is just a, a big example of what you can find all around coastlines, all around the world, actually. So now I'm going to move um, on to resources. I'm going to talk a bit more about terrestrial resources, um, which is uh, another enormous uh, subject. So that was just a very quick little uh, bit on, um, on that. So obviously, um, the, the best way to recover uh, resources, uh, the, to recover the protein, because we don't have very many 
finds. We don't, you know, we have to go with what we find and what you mostly find are animal bones. And so there's a huge, um, a huge uh, academic business, let's say grown up, uh, of academic inquiry uh, looking at the use of exploitation of protein animals because uh, it's what it, that's what's there. And um, carbon and nitrogen stable isotope, al al stable isotope analysis is used uh, to reconstruct the protein part of the diet. Okay, it's really important that we focus that they focus only on the protein part. So the plants are completely missing from this whole story. And this particular study was quite interesting because one of the great topics is how Neanderthals died out, like I say. And this subject, this this work, actually this study, was looking at the distribution of which whether the Neanderthals and the modern humans looked for different types of animals or why, if they, if they could get any information as to why Neanderthals died out based on the animal resources they were using and using sulfur carbon isotopes, they discovered that the modern humans were actually exploiting a much wider range, um, geographical range than uh, the, um, the Neanderthals. And so this may help to explain that they were more highly adaptable or whatever. This is Gibraltar. Uh, this is the one of the best and Neanderthal sites in uh, in southern Europe. Actually, it's an absolutely couple of fantastic sites here. And here, um, they have gone very into great detail, looking at the social issues related to Neanderthals. How socially conscious were they? How culturally aware were they? Did they did they practice cultural uh, behaviour and so on? And here, they focused on the study of um, of uh, uh, birds and looking at uh, uh, the extraction of feathers. Feathers is not, obviously, they're not edible, therefore they are indicators of um, social activity, not related to um, subsistence. And so the Gibraltar work is very, very nice indeed. And of course, it's a good example of when we're looking at sites, we have to be very careful to remember always that the environment we're looking at, the geography that we're looking at was very different when the uh, people were living there. So. Um, 30,000 years ago when people were um, living and when the Neanderthals were living in um, in southern southern um, Iberia though Gibraltar wasn't Gibraltar it was part of it was the edge of a huge plain that stretched out um, into what is nowadays the Gibraltar Straits and the Gibraltarians have done a lot of work uh, reconstructing the uh, environment uh, of this area and uh, the works great what they do really good really interesting so one of the problems um, with what I do, which is trying to reconstruct um, what plants were used in the Paleolithic is, first of all, that there's very or virtually no evidence. Second of all, um, there's been a very long-standing con construction of plants not existing in the Paleolithic. It's been animals and uh, bone, uh, stone tools. Unfortunately, this is because you know, in the last hundred or hundred and fifty years since uh, since since archaeology really archaeological inquiry happened, it's been almost entirely conducted by men, and therefore women simply don't feature. Um, the fact that the men, these young adolescent males who went out hunt hunting mammoths with their spears, actually had to have mothers, seems to have been forgotten. And so um, it's extremely difficult because we're fighting a really, really serious uphill battle with uh, the male-dominated uh, research environment, which concentrates on animals, on protein, on spears, on weapons, and so on. And this is something that continues today. Uh, there's a few of us, so quite a, an increasing number of people who are starting to you know fight this fighting our corner and it is slowly becoming recognized but it's very difficult and I'm explaining this because this actually feeds into what I do and I think the main problem the main main problem in trying to understand that in the past people really used plants an awful lot is because we no longer have the ecological knowledge that people had in the past and it is extremely difficult for modern day people to recognize and acknowledge that in the past people were not less than we were, they were different. The ecological, their, 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 their lives, their livelihood, their survivability depended on the depth of their understanding of the environment which was really extraordinary and we've simply lost that and replaced it with social our, our, our social abilities and so you get Mr. Yanka who can negotiate anything but you put Mr. Yanka in a forest and he'll have a nervous breakdown because he will not know what to eat and of course when you're in a, an environment like that it's the knowing what not to eat 
is the most important thing because so many plants are poisonous. And so um, there's this absolute concept that we've somehow moved forwards and we haven't. We've moved sideways. It was different in the past. People were different. People had a different set of very, very deep, complex knowledge that we don't have any longer, except perhaps the people in this room, maybe. <laughs> But in the usual general terms, um, it's, it's basically, certainly in Northern Europe, where I come from, in the general public, it's extinct. It simply doesn't exist anymore. It's a little bit better here and it's much better in Africa. But uh, this knowledge is really important because it's what built us. So this is simply uh, one example of um, the type of numbers of sites and evidence that we have from the Paleolithic. We've got about 20 sites altogether across a million years of evidence of plants, actual plant remains. Um, a lot of these are, are hackberry, uh, which is quite interesting, but the male-dominated archaeological field argue that these uh, hackberry, although they are repeated on archaeological sites, they argue that they were brought in by animals. It's very, very, very difficult to convince people that if you're getting repeated patterns of a particular plant, and hackberry, I think it has, a, it has something in it that allows, uh, it has preferential survival. It's got, I can't remember what the chemistry of it is, but something that enables it to survive better than a lot of other plants, and I'm, I've completely forgotten what that was. But anyway, this is just to show you this, it, basically we're talking about a million years here. Uh, and that's about it, you know, there's, there's really not much more than that. And so we're fighting a very uphill battle when we're looking for the carbonized remains, which is what we get, the actual remains of plants, physical remains of plants. Um, this is one of, uh, I'm just going to mention a couple of sites of absolutely amazing sites. This is the site of Gesher Benot Yakov. It's 790,000 years old. I had to mention it. It's absolutely incredible. I was there in February. It's on the edge of the Jordan River. But this is just to give you an example of uh, the type of, uh, of things that, uh, that we find. And so this has a very, very, uh, very complex and uh, very broad um, uh, assemblage of, uh, of plants from uh, a, very, a very long time ago, but it's the only one. There are no other sites uh, up until 60,000 years ago with any plant remains at all of any um, substance. Uh, and uh, looking at the type of, looking socially at the kind of uh, assemblage that there is, um, it seems very clear that there was such a broad range of plants eaten or that were, were, were brought onto the site that it was more like people were not actually consciously going out and selecting food. It was more like animals grazing because it was very broad and there was no structure to the assemblage, uh, the type of plants and everything. You know, it wasn't deliberately edible or medicinal or whatever, it was just a bit of everything. And that is just to show, this, this is the kind of thing we work with. This is a camera about this size and the types of, uh, these are little tiny nut fragments. And I have to say the work that's been done here is absolutely extraordinary, r brilliant work, absolutely amazing work. Um, but it's the only site which makes it very difficult. Then we jump to uh, 21,000 years ago. Oh, hello, this was a, an amazing site. It's no coincidence, by the way, that all these sites are in Israel. They have absolutely fantastic survival, um, something to do with the environment. It's very, very good for survival of these, uh, of these sites in Israel. Also, the Israelis are extremely good at, um, at the work that they do. They're very, very good at it. They're very, very good at uh, the archaeobotany. Um, and, uh, and they find the, the material and they have the money to actually be able to go into it and really study the, the sites and the remains in great detail. Uh, Ohalo is a very interesting site. It was in the Sea of Galilee and um, there was uh, a little village there. The village burnt down and it was almost immediately submerged. Uh, by sea level rise very, very rapidly indeed, and therefore it became anaerobic, which is why there's such a great survival of um, plant remains here. It's very, very unusual. But uh, it was a very, very carefully studied, and you can see the different types of... Um, this is just an example of some of the kinds of plants that, uh, that, were, uh, that were found um, at Ohalo. Um, and occasionally, the, the other way that we can look for plants, but it's uh, slight, it's less precise because you can't actually tell what, the, you can only tell the kind of group of plants that the, that the, that the uh, remain, remains come from are obviously the phytoliths because they're silica, therefore they survive uh, where plant remains don't survive, but they don't give a very precise information. So I'm going to move on to my work now. And so the frustration of, um, first of all, not being able to find 
uh, any um, actual evidence. And the second frustration of having to fight a rearguard action against people every time you did find anything to say, well, actually, no, they didn't actually, and you know, it was brought by animals and things. I decided the only way to do this was to link the plant directly to the hominin. And so there are only two ways of doing that. You either what they took in the mouth or what they pooped out the back. And so um, the stuff out the back is very, very difficult because you first have to do the DNA analysis to ensure that it's not a, an animal, etc. And there's also, it's also very rare. So what I do is I work with dental calculus. Now, dental calculus is something that we all unfortunately know about because we all have it. Um, when you uh, when you don't clean your teeth for 12 hours and it's uh, used to get this filmy filmy stuff on your teeth uh, which is dental plaque um, and if you don't um, clean this off it can accumulate in here in the gingival crevice which is the gap between the tooth and the gum uh, and within uh, 10 to 12 days or sorry yeah t around 12 days it calcifies and once it calcifies it stays it endures you cannot get it off except by the dentist going in there and scraping which is when the dentist goes in and scrapes inside your teeth that's what they're doing they're taking off the calcified plaque and just to show that how long it can survive as uh, dental calculus has been found on a Sheba pithecus sample between 12 and 8 million years old this is tough stuff it really is but for archaeologists it's absolutely brilliant because of course uh, in the past, uh, not everyone had the same type of, uh, of oral hygiene as we have now, and most, uh, most populations in the past had uh, have dental calculus of some form or other. Some, some, some of them have a lot, some of them only have a little, but it's, an, it's turning into the most amazing resource to look at what went into the mouth, because when something goes into the mouth and it can be eating, drinking, breathing, whatever, bits of it get stuck in the dental calculus and so it's an absolutely unequivocal way of saying if it was there it was obviously put in the mouth. So these are some examples of some of the work I've done. This is Kesem Cave, another Israeli site. It's 400,000 years old. So what I do is um, I work with a, an, a, a, an archaeological chemist so I take the samples, I degrade them in acid, hydrochloric acid, and I literally just degrade the stuff, and I take what's left, and I put it on microscope slides, and I see what I can find. And so here, this is what I found at Kesem, examples of some of the things I found at Kesem Cave. So we find pollen, this is a, a fragment of an insect wing, this is a phytolith, we get spores, this is microcharcoal, and we get starch granules. And so, of course, always uh, raw because starch granules gelatinize when they're cooked. But uh, this is giving us uh, direct insight to uh, what went into the mouth. So we get evidence of uh, microenvironmental data and also dietary data. This work is, uh, is, is much more precise. It's very, very much more complex, though. This is the, uh, the chemistry. Uh, I work with someone called Stephen Buckley, who is uh, a UK chemist. Um, who is, uh, he's a specialist actually in mummification techniques of Egyptian mummies. So he works, his, his real thing is uh, reconstructing what resins, what plant resins were used, the combination of plant resins were used to mummify Egyptian mummies. And um, he's done absolutely amazing work and actually even mummified a, a real modern human who agreed to be mummified before he was about to die. And Stephen went off and did a mummification experiment which was televised and won a national award for the best science TV program of the year in about 2013. Quite amazing. I watched it. It was absolutely horrific. But anyway, <laughs> that's Stephen. Um, and so Stephen, uh, we decided we were sharing an office together in York actually and I said, look, can you use this? Let's, let's give it a go. And we got some dental calculus from some recent spe specimens and we tried it and it worked. And so this is giving us chemical evidence of um, when, sometimes, not always, but when, when, it, when it works, we get chemical evidence of um, plant, uh, of uh, bio, biomolecular information from, um, of plant, uh, plant, bits of plant basically or plants and this one uh, this is the oldest evidence in the world of um, of direct chemical evidence of ingestion of um, of plants and uh, here we were almost entirely sure that it's pine nuts and uh, because uh, but uh, we he, he found high abundances of linoleic and linolenic acids which are essential polyunsaturated fatty acids that only occur in plants so they had to eat them and they only could come from plants so they had to have come from 
different plants. So we were able to prove absolutely and definitively that these Kesem cave hominins from 400,000 years ago were eating plants, which was quite, um, quite a big thing, really. Going even further back, this is Sima dell'Elefante. I really like mentioning this one because it's uh, the oldest hominin in Europe, 1.2 million years. It's from Atapuerca, which some of you may know. Um, and uh, we degraded. It's pretty scary doing this because you're taking these samples that are 1.2 million years old, unique, the only thing that the only one that exists in the world, and we have to degrade them. And so you have to be quite brave. <laughs> You have to be very brave to do it. Anyway, it worked really well and um, we had evidence of, uh, obviously, uh, these, they can't really tell us any more than that. Uh, probably grasses, uh, they were eating grasses. Um, and uh, this is uh, even some pollen, which we got quite a few of these pollen grains, which was really amazing. Uh, and uh, obviously spores always, and this amorphous blob, which might be, might be animal-based. And so it told us stuff that simply no one had ever known before. Um, because at Atapuerca they, uh, they don't have plant remains at all from Cima del Elefante and so uh, they don't have pollen either, they don't have anything at all so we were able to access, to go directly in to, although it's tiny, absolutely minute given the time scale and everything, it tells you something and when, uh, when you know something you don't unknow it. So we know for a fact definitively for example that by 400,000 years ago people were exploiting um, things like pine nuts, we know that now which we didn't know before. And of course the environment, so particles up to 70 microns are habitually inhaled and um, so you can get uh, micro-environmental data as well. We get micro-environmental data based, uh, based on this. So Kesem Cave is quite an interesting site because it's one of the earliest sites in the world at 400,000 years old of habitual use of fire. I'm not talking about fire today, it's a, huge, uh, it's a huge topic that really would take about, you know, a whole lecture to talk about, so I'm not talking about it. But um, Kesem Cave is one of the earliest sites in the world with repeated a multi-use half. And um, we found, which was really cool, we found evidence of microcharcoal, so they were clearly sitting around their half inside the cave, uh, breathing in uh, the smoke while they were doing whatever they were doing around their hearth, because we got quite higher concentrations than you would get from natural fires. You know, there were quite high concentrations, obviously, in an enclosed environment, uh, breathing in smoke. Um, and we can also even work out what the smoke is. Uh, in this case, I think it was wood smoke. You get this from the, uh, from, from the chemistry. So this was... Uh, this was kind of touted as the world's earliest evidence of, uh, or of environmental contamination because all these things are uh, contaminants uh, that cause people problems today. Allergens. Now I'm going to move to El Cidron, Asturias. Again, it might be a site that uh, you know about. It's uh, 49,000 years old. It's a Neanderthal site. And um, we got absolutely, I think we, this was our best uh, site. We got some really fantastic data on this. So we got some really interesting cultural data from, from this as well. We got um, chemical biomarkers of bitumen and pitch. Now bitumen and pitch are both uh, natural glues. Bitumen, obviously, it's, uh, it occurs naturally, it seeps out in different places, and when it's heated, certain types of bitumen, when it's heated, it can be used as glue. Um, uh, and it also has very identifiable chemical biomarkers, and so we can all, always uh, work out where it came from. We always know where, when we get um, bit bitumen on archaeological sites, we can always go straight back and, and source it, which is very useful social information. Pitch is really, really interesting because it can only be obtained through um, oxygen-free fire, dry distillation pyrolysis, which is um, obviously an oxygen-free fire. And we're talking about 60, 80, 100,000 years ago, we have archaeological evidence for pitch. And uh, we got it also, the fact is it was in the mouth. They were obviously chewing the pitch in preparation for using it. And, oh, uh, yeah. So this is a marker. It's only one, but it shows us that in the Middle Paleolithic, the hominins were, had a sufficient uh, technological and materials knowledge to be able to practice this incredibly complex uh, uh, technology. They must have really understood their bark, their, per their, 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 their trees, their wood and everything because you can't extract pitch without um, a, an anaerobic fire at a specific temperature. You need a container to, uh, to, to collect it. It's, it's very difficult to do um, even today and it's particularly difficult to do when you have no no, no um, 
no modern materials at all to do it in. So uh, it's, a, it's an absolute marker for, for technology and materials understanding and understanding, ecological understanding as well, the use of pitch. So the other thing that, uh, that we um, found at El Cidron were evidence of uh, yarrow and chamomile. Uh, both of these, uh, neither of these are um, edible. They, none of them have new edible properties. None of them you wouldn't eat them in order to, you know, for your diet. Um, but they're both uh, medicinal, and so we um, suggested that this that they'd been eaten for medicinal purposes. And I'll explain why in the end uh, we decided because they could have been eaten just by accident, or they could have been eaten um, to, for to flavor or whatever. But I'm almost, uh, I'm absolutely sure it was medicinal. The same. Because of this uh, work we did, samples were then uh, reanalyzed again uh, using DNA when uh, the DNA was able to be uh, used on these tiny samples. And again, um, this is a work I was also involved in. They found more evidence of uh, medicinal type uh, plants and uh, fungi and also were able to sequence different, two different bacteria. One related to um, an oral abscess and the other one, um, an intestinal, um, intestinal bacteria. And so we were able in this to link the, um, the, 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 the illness to the treatment, which was uh, quite amazing. And so it's really put the whole um, concept of paleomedicine and the use of plants for medicinal purposes on the agenda now. This is another sample. It's, um, it's a plant that's extremely well known, which is why I've put it in. I'm sure you'll all know it, Ciparis rotundus. It's uh, known as the world's worst weed because of the way it spreads in tropical places. I'm sure some of you must already know about this. Um, and we found it consistently in all our samples in, an, in, a, in a cemetery in, uh, in Sudan. And um, we couldn't understand why, because this period crossed over the introduction of agriculture and we still had the Ciparis rotundus which is a very difficult plant to process uh, in terms of it's much easier to go out and get your cereals for your carbohydrates. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult plant to harvest. It's uh, picky and fiddly and difficult. So why would they go on eating it? And um, we then discovered that Ciparis rotundus, um, the extract, I think it's rotundine, can inhibit Streptococcus mutans which is one of the, the main um, the, the, main, um, the main pathogens, the main, one of the main things that actually damages the teeth and causes dental caries. And um, the uh, population of, uh, of uh, Alkidae had a very low, unexpectedly low proportion of uh, dental problem dental problems and so uh, we think this is probably because of them uh, eating the Ciparis rotundus all the time and they were probably doing it for medicinal purposes or not but it affected uh, their oral um, health. So to contextualize self-medication when you want to try to understand an evolutionary, um, an evolutionary behavior and you don't have the data what we do is we go back to the last common ancestor. Okay, now the last common ancestor is a hypothetical being who uh, existed uh, at some time around six million years ago. Uh, these are some examples of how the last common ancestor has helped us because um, there is an assumption that is generally accepted that anything that a chimpanzee can do today was already um, within the capabilities of the last common ancestor, which means that you can look at chimpanzee behavior and you can link it to an evolutionary behavior of the hominin lineage, let's say. So these are some of the things, tool use behavior and so on. So I simply applied the same methodology to uh, the use of medicinal, of plants for medicinal purposes. And um, in fact, uh, all higher primates uh, self-medicate. Most other animals self-medicate also. Chimpanzees use a huge number of different plants uh, in self-medication. So do gorillas. This is a couple of examples of what they do. Uh, I just concentrated and uh, we just concentrate on the parasites uh, because parasite infestation is obviously something that affects uh, everybody and every animal and everything. And they are, these are very, very well studied um, behaviors of use of particular plants uh, to treat uh, in treatment. And oh yeah, that's just uh, sort of saying how, how serious parasite infestation is. It affects everybody all the time. So then I decided to go a little bit further into this and I looked at uh, all the plant assemblages I could find from this particular area, which is the area where there are more plant assemblages from different periods. So I looked from 790,000 years up to 11,000 years ago. And 
I split the plants. I, I got 212 plants. I was looking on the web, and this is the work that I hope I'll be able to develop more in the future to make it more consistent, but I looked on the web to find the information I could about the properties of these plants, their medicinal properties, their edible properties, and so on, and I was able to find information for 212 plants, and so I split them into plants that were purely medicinal, plants that had mostly medicinal properties, plants that had mostly edible properties, and looked at why they were being collected. So this is an example of a poisonous plant. Whether they were collected for medicinal or poisonous purposes, it's impossible to know, but it occurs in several, quite a number of the, of the, of the sites. So looking at uh, why, why they might have collected this, it wasn't for food, it was for something else, probably medicinal. This is a really cool um, uh, study, it's not one of mine, uh, but 24,000, a site that was 24,000 years old has traces of castor oil um, uh, plant on it and of course it's one of the most, uh, the, 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 the seed of the castor oil plant is one of the most toxic substances that exists uh, in the world, natural substances that exists, but inside the seed you've got a very high, highly medicinal properties. Um, the oil is very, very medicinal indeed. And uh, so we don't know, of course, whether this was uh, collected for medicinal purposes or for um, or for poisonous purposes, they could have been using it to 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 put poison arrows or whatever. But what it does is it tells us that by this time there was an there was such a level of knowledge and understanding of plants that they were able they were confident to be able to use this uh, incredibly dangerous substance. This is uh, my favourite plant of all time, I think, the Silibum marianum, a milk thistle. It's uh, extremely abundant, it's very, very, very medicinal indeed. And it was a great pleasure to me in February to go back to Geshe Benot Yaakov, where they had uh, found it uh, in 790,000 years ago, and find it all over the place, it's still there, which is great. And it occurs in a lot of sites, and it's particularly good for um, cleaning out the liver if you've been poisoned or whatever. And so it's a brilliant plant, uh, this one actually, and was uh, found in a lot of different sites and was undoubtedly used for its uh, medicinal properties. This is one, uh, this is my last one I think, but uh, it's just, this is a really amazing site. So 14,000 years ago, this is a site in Morocco, we're talking just before agriculture, um, but the people were exploiting some very highly high carbohydrates, uh, so very highly nutritious plants such as acorns and pistachios and of course the, carbo the sugars in the carbohydrate are very bad for the teeth. And so uh, they had appalling, appalling oral hygiene. They had terrible teeth. In fact, when you look at some of these mandibles, it just actually makes, you f makes me feel ill because they must have lived in agony their whole lives. Um, but they also had a lot of juniper. Now, juniper is not particularly nutritious by comparison to pistachio nuts and acorns and things, but it has very high, uh, very, very strong antiseptic, anti-inflammatory and antifungal properties. And I think that most likely that this uh, plant would have been collected for its medicinal properties. And uh, probably, and it is still used uh, quite widely, I think, uh, in the area for uh, medicinal purposes. So it's a very uh, nice uh, use um, of, a, of a plant uh, for its natural properties. And then I looked at the percentage of plants with medicinal properties. These are the world, is, world, uh, the world averages, China, which is a very, very high proportion of medicinal plants, chimpanzees, and then I looked at all the archaeological sites and I realized that they were much, much, much higher. The, the selection of medicinal plants must have been deliberate because um, the, uh, the proportions were so much higher than the natural. Uh, the increase in deliberately specifically medicinal plants goes shooting up at the beginning of the Neolithic, whereas the more random plants that have both edible and medicinal properties goes down, correlated directly with the introduction of agriculture. So people were dropping off the use of, um, of less nutritious plants and focusing more deliberately on the probably grown agricultural plants and also the ones that were highly medicinal and leaving out the, the, the ones in the middle. So this represents a drop in the broad spectrum use and uh, probably knowledge, ecological knowledge of their environments because they were restricting their use of plants at this time. And this just shows that um, the highly medicinal plants were far more likely to occur on uh, more than one site. And so this was probably a question of information sharing and sharing the knowledge of these plants and the plant properties.
So contextualizing hormone and self-medication, this is why it's important because of the obsession today with medicines. And this is a particularly USA thing you might uh, know about, but these are USA uh, uh, figures. But the, uh, the need and the desire for medicine is so vast that it has been explained evolutionarily. There's no other way to explain it. And also the other uh, issue is, of course, the enormous amount of uh, psycho uh, mind-altering drugs. So this obsession, the, 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 the huge problem there is with the mind-altering drugs, or whether it's a problem or not is your point of view, but with the, the use of, of mind-altering drugs is absolutely enormous. And so this has also been linked to the use of medicines evolutionarily. And what I've been able to show is that I think I can actually show it running right through the past. And so confirming the theories that this may have a, an evolutionary um, basis so what, what's the point of all of this? What, knowing about plant use and history, what can this tell us about today? Well, there are lots and lots of things, but the things that I've focused on today is that evolutionary paleo diet is not only about secondary comp, it's not only about nutrition, it's not only about carbohydrates and proteins, that we, like plants, need our secondary compounds too. We need to be able to eat these edible medicinal plants. And in the past, when you look at all these uh, big assemblages of plants, they had huge components of plants that were not particularly nutritious when I'm going way in the back but also but all had medicinal properties as well so there was a much broader spectrum of a wide variety of different um, different things that were useful in the diet not just the carbohydrates it was everything else as well all the all the medicinal properties were really important uh, that like I said there is a measurable now evolutionary basis for uh, human dependence on psychoactive substances and medicines which I've been able to trace right through prehistory and really confirm this uh, this evolutionary focus on that and then finally um, this that this is all based on this incredibly ancient ecological knowledge that has accumulated over millions and millions of years and it's quite sad to think that it's disappeared so quickly except in this room so um, it's very important <laughs> indeed yeah it's very great uh, to be saying this in front of a, of a population or a, a group of people who are probably the only for some of the few people on the planet who really understand that um, but that's uh, that's it anyway so thanks that's <laughs>
determined actually whether you know if they're in a much more rich environment like there was in Spain than in northern uh, northern Europe they perhaps didn't eat so much meat and maybe were able to use their plants more yeah, and, and only a second question okay. is it's, it's also curious that you found there uh, articles that show that these guys they, they, they didn't invent the chimneys yeah. <laughs> but this is still in, this, in our times if you go to the Andes and all these places and you live in, in, with the local people there they don't have chimneys. Yeah. I wonder why. Uh, can you can you can you explain that? Well, I don't know anything about the Andes, but well, this was first of all this was a huge cave. It wasn't a house, okay? Yeah. And so it was a natural environment. Okay. Yeah. Uh, secondly. Um, there are lots of, uh, so I don't know in that respect, but you're right, at Chatal Huyuk, for example, which is uh, one of the world's earliest village in Turkey, they didn't have chimneys either. Um, and uh, incredibly unhealthy. Um, I had a, in fact, I had a, one of my, um, the, one of the students that uh, did some work with me did her PhD on medieval England. And she found exactly the same thing, that she could d uh, differentiate between the women who were inside the houses, uh, breathing in this incredibly unhealthy environment and the men who are outside. And I don't know. I mean, it's, it's perhaps it's just... Uh, no, no, I, maybe it's just actually the, the lack of respect for women that uh, because they're the ones, the women are the ones who have to be in these terrible environments and the men are outside and so actually women don't... Still is the case these days with the Andes, for example. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. But I mean, it, you know, it's the gender difference. Possibly it's just simply become a cultural thing. But yeah, you would be able to see it in their dental calculus. But why? I don't know. Hmm. I'm not sure if I got that right, but you said that there was this one population that ate plenty of carbohydrates and then the, the teeth were, yeah. uh, were screwed. Uh, but they were eating exactly what, acorns then? Yeah, they were eating, um, I can show you, I've got the whole list what they were eating. That's it there. Acorns, pistachio nuts, pine nuts, pulses and wild oats. Because this was before agriculture. Mm. But and that was the main diet of these people? Uh, yeah. Carbohydrates are very sugary. Mm -hmm. When you cook carbohydrates, I mean that's what you're doing. You're, uh, it's it's uh, it's the sugars in the carbohydrates that cause the problems in the teeth. Okay, but then they were cooking them. Or yeah, of course. Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, sorry, I mean I didn't mention the whole fire story. Fire became habitual after around 400,000 years ago. So anything more recent than that will have been cooked. Yes, and there's a whole other story about um, salivary amylase and uh, the processing of carbohydrates in the saliva and things, but yeah. Okay, so, so on, uh, apart from that, what else were they eating? Well, uh, from this site, uh, animals, I think they, well, they had one particular kind of animal. It's not a site I worked on, um, but I can't remember, but there was, it was goats or it was something like that so as well. Like 20% animal, 80% carbohydrate? You can't tell that. We just don't know because we can't quantify anything. So it's impossible to tell. I th uh, and in this site, as I say, it's not a site that I've worked on. I just, uh, I always pick it out to look at, just talk about it because it's so absolutely clear to me that, the, that they were using this plant. Um, and they had such appalling, I mean, this is, you know, you don't often see such terrible um, dental, dental problems in pre, uh, early prehistoric uh, populations, but this has been absolutely linked to the, to, to the very high proportion of these uh, sugary carbohydrates that they were eating, I think. Yeah, so I can't tell you uh, any more than that about it. I suppose this technique of using these uh, deposits, gum deposits, can be applied to any kind of animals nowadays and validated with uh, yeah. observations of what they actually eat. Not all animals make it. Not all animals make dental calculus. Um, some animals do and some, some animals don't. And I'm just trying really, really hard. I think pigs don't make it. Uh, we've tried actually to do experiments and it's quite difficult. Um, there's, uh, the, 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 the actual structure of the calculus is much more difficult to degrade it. This degrades very quickly with hydrochloric acid. We can degrade it very fast. Um, and um, so it's just a, it would be a question of uh, sitting down and doing experiments. But yes, you can reconstruct. You can use it on some animals, yeah. Thanks for this fascinating view into the past. I, what I find amazing is, so from, I mean, I didn't really knew very little about this before your talk, but it seems amazing that there was this expectation that humans were not using plants that much for 
Incredible. So if, if you look at how important brands have been since the Neolithic, well, I, mean, I, I would always expect through human history, wh why on earth anyone would expect that humans wouldn't use plants that were there? And we know for sure they are quite useful for many people. Well, I completely agree with you. Uh, yeah, why is that? I mean, I find it very useful I think it's uh, a male arrogance, yeah, actually. I'm sorry, but yeah, it's yeah. just incredible. No. Just because of what you. Um, uh, just because, uh, you know, if you're looking uh, two-dimensionally, you find, consistently you find on the archaeological sites, stones and bones, stones and bones, stones and bones, and then it's com consolidated by the stable isotope analysis, which is almost entirely done by men as well. And they just, so, the problem now, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a real pr professional problem because so many people have built their careers on this, and now suddenly everyone's saying, well, hang on a minute, you know, there is a little bit more to this than that, and in fact, um, one of the people in that uh, carbon, uh, the stable isotope analysis work that I, I showed there, um, Hervé Boscherenz is uh, someone, he's great, he's in, he's uh, <coughs> French, and he's working uh, very hard on trying to use the stable isotopes, uh, using amino acids, uh, to try to just separate out um, and try to find evidence of plants and I think is, he's one of the people who's pushing forward the fact that actually there's something a little bit wrong with the stable isotope evidence as it is now because they talk about carnivores you know the Neanderthals were carnivores no they weren't carnivores have different uh, digestive systems they were not carnivores but they still say this so yeah it is incredible Yes, I know that, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder whether it would be nice to make a comparison of uh, what our society still know about our environment and our plants with the, pal uh, mm. the, the pal uh, yeah, the trouble is we have so little information. You know, the ethnobotany that's going on um, at the moment is uh, huge in comparison with what we can find, but absolutely. I mean, well, in fact, um, one of the um, people I think I cited here, one of the Israelis, is an Israeli archaeobotanist. He's an absolutely fantastic um, archaeobotanist, Ehud Weiss. And he and I were talking um, a while back, and he said, you know, my, my aim in life is to find plants that we've forgotten about that we can then start to reuse again, either as medicines or as food and things. And that's uh, what we're trying to do, you know, in a way it's what we're trying to do is to find the plants that were useful in the past, like for example the Silibum marianum, it's everywhere in early prehistory. And it's not a plant that's used anymore. But we're, we're moving in that direction, we <clears throat> look at the germplasm, so there are germplasm collections around the world, and we're down to, you know, ten corn varieties or three wheat varieties. And we're going back in time and we're looking at the germplasm where there were you know, 10,000. The land races. We call them land races, races. yeah. So on, because it exactly. contains the genetic material yeah. that may be well suited for future climates. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So we have to look back in time. But, but you're talking about plants that you already know about. There must be hundreds of plants that have been used and with this knowledge that's disappeared that we've forgotten about. We don't know anything about at all. But people have been looking at pollen and lots of things like that. We we know we can go back in time. Here. Yeah, but pollen isn't pollen is environment. It's not food. Pollen gives you ideas. Uh, gives you evidence of environment. That's why we can't use pollen to look at di diet because you can't. It's it's environmental, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Karen, the the what about the? You talked about the substances employed to um, alter your mind, uh, your behavior. What about? Uh, alcohol and you know, fermentation, what, what the, uh, 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 is there any, any evidence that people drunk to, as opposed to ate? That's really interesting as well, yeah. So archaeologically, the earliest, trying to remember this now, I think it's in Georgia, and I think it's about 13 or 14, maybe it's less than that, between seven and 14,000 years ago, there's actual evidence of the world's earliest wine or something like this. And there's the world's earliest beer, which is around the same period of time. There is a guy called John Smith from USA, actually, who's uh, argued a lot for um, much earlier fermentation of foods and things that could also explain the stable isotope um, signatures too. But fermentation is something, I mean, if you worked in the Arctic, you must know about uh, fermentation of foods and things, um, probably very, very ancient indeed. Whether that translated, but it probably did, into psycho, whatever it is, mind-altering drinks as well, yes. But the archaeological evidence is much more recent. Mm. Okay.
Any more questions? No? Well, then, uh, okay. many thanks again for the fascinating talk. Thanks. Karen. Thank you.